Hello. In this episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing low urine output, specifically how to approach a nursing page about low urine output in a patient already admitted to the hospital. While this is less likely to trigger a rapid response call than other acute problems covered in this series, the general principles are still the same. Imagine that as an intern or resident, you're standing in line for an afternoon coffee to carry you through the call day when you receive this text page. Jessica calling regarding patient Bashar. Urine output has been 150 milliliters over the last eight hours. Vitals are normal. Patient is feeling fine. Please advise. After you pick up your dose of caffeine, uh, you start walking over to the patient's ward to assess what might be going on. And on the way, you start considering a few things. The first consideration is that low urine output is not the same thing as acute kidney injury. One can imagine a Venn diagram that shows acute kidney injury is more common than clinically significant low urine output. Also, most patients with AKI do not have low urine output, but most patients with low urine output do have some degree of AKI. If you've recently attended a lecture or noon conference on AKI, you might be thinking, wait a minute, low urine output is one of the criteria for AKI. And that's true. In 2012, the KDIGO AKI workgroup did come up with the most widely accepted definition of AKI, and your output less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour averaged over six hours qualifies. I am not implying that I understand AKI better than a room full of the world's leading nephrology experts, but within the context of an acute page in the hospital from the bedside nurse about low urine output, some of these patients will have absolutely nothing wrong with their kidneys, at least not yet, provided that you quickly address the underlying problem. I don't want to belabor this, but from the original statement from KDIGO's original practice guidelines, the use of urine output criteria for diagnosis and staging of AKI has been less well validated and in individual patients, the need for clinical judgment regarding the effects of drugs, fluid balance, and other factors must be included. The next consideration is how low is low enough to be acutely concerned. That is, to be concerned enough that you are going to either physically examine the patient at this moment or place an order for an intervention. Different sources would say different things here. I've seen the 0.5 mils per kg per hour over six hours criteria used. I've seen under 30 mils per hour for two to four hours. And I've seen under 300 mils total over a span of eight hours or uh, a, a nursing shift. But the real answer is that it depends. It depends on the risk the patient has developed volume depletion, sepsis, or worsening cardiac failure based on the reason they're in the hospital to begin with. It depends on whether the patient has been receiving diuretics. And it depends on whether the patient has a Foley catheter or a urostomy or a nephrostomy. The next consideration you'll be thinking over as you walk to the patient's room is the list of etiologies of low urine output. You might be tempted to think of this diagnostic framework, which is a relatively thorough framework for acute kidney injury. But remember, that's not exactly the situation here. The cause needs to be something which progresses from undetectable on your daily chemistry panel to severe enough to be causing low urine output within the same day. Some of these diagnoses, such as AIN, vasculitis, TTP, and even hepatorenal syndrome, don't typically do that. So what does that leave us? The pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal organization to the framework is still a good one, but the specific etiologies are a little different. Pre-renal etiologies of low urine output, meaning that the primary problem is one of hemodynamics, includes hypovolemia and heart failure. There is a common error that early clinicians make in that they assume pre-renal and hypovolemia are synonymous, but the kidney cannot tell if poor perfusion is from low cardiac output due to hypovolemia or low cardiac output due to low contractility. In both situations, the effect on electrolytes and urine composition is the same. Intravenal disease is much less common a cause of acutely low urine output, but it can be seen with sepsis-triggered ATN. However, post-renal causes are much more numerous here. This is where we find benign prostatic hyperplasia, 
This is, of course, a chronic problem and does not develop over a span of a single hospitalization. However, what does happen is that a man's outpatient alpha blocker could be held on admission, either intentionally or accidentally. And having BPH puts a patient at a much higher risk of urinary retention from other causes on this list. Medications can trigger acute urinary retention. The most commonly cited include antihistamines, opiates, tricyclic antidepressants, Haldol, and muscle relaxants. Spinal cord dysfunction, such as that seen with an epidural abscess or spinal metastasis, can also cause this issue. Urinary retention is very common immediately after surgery or childbirth. It can be caused by severe constipation. And of course, it, be, it can be caused by catheter dysfunction. For example, a clogged or kinked Foley. So now we've been thinking about all these things and we finally reach Mr. Bashar's room and he's just kind of hanging out in the hospital bed looking okay. How do we evaluate what is going on? Every evaluation for low urine output should begin with ruling out urinary retention. That's because it's common, it's easy to treat, and you will get worse very quickly if you give either fluids or diuretics. If the patient does not have a Foley catheter or other tube draining the urine, check what is called a post-void residual. This means determine how much urine is remaining in the bladder after the patient tries to void on their own. And that last part is important to remember. A PVR can be checked non-invasively with a bladder scanner or invasively with what's called a straight cath. Here's a picture of a typical bladder scanner. This is the specific model that was used in my last hospital. Something that I did not appreciate about bladder scanners until I actually saw one uh, in use is that they are really primitive. I knew that they were based on ultrasound, and so I naturally assumed that they displayed a typical ultrasound-like image, and some more modern models do this, but many just show you something like this, a super low-resolution circular figure to help the operator direct the probe at the bladder, but otherwise it just gives you a number that the machine calculates as the current bladder volume. One important caveat to these machines is that they are not accurate in patients with ascites, since the machine is incapable of differentiating fluid in the bladder from fluid in an ascites pocket. Regarding the straight cath, when ordered in the hospital, it sometimes implies using a Foley catheter to see what the volume of urine is and to leave it in place if that volume is above some relatively arbitrary value. How high does that volume need to be? Well, if it's more than 600 mils, it should stay in. If it's less than 200, I would leave it out. But if the volume is somewhere between 200 and 600, it depends. It depends on whether the cause of retention is quickly reversible, like a medication side effect. It depends on how critical it is to be monitoring urine output in that particular patient. And it depends on patient preference. Some patients are particularly opposed to Foley catheters or seem to have greater discomfort from them, and that should be taken into consideration. Lastly, if the patient already has a Foley present, you or the bedside nurse need to ensure that it is neither clogged nor kinked. To ensure it's not clogged by blood or random urinary sediment and debris, it can be flushed with sterile saline. Now, if you've ruled out obstruction as the cause of low urine output, the next steps include assessing the patient's volume status, which is a whole talk of its own, but involves consideration of the history, particularly the patient's current clinical situation, as well as objective observations on exam, such as the patient's JVP, or the appearance of the IVC on ultrasound. Assess for other evidence of kidney injury, which could include a chemistry panel and urinalysis. I personally do not think sending urine electrolytes just for the reason of low urine output is a helpful thing to do, but I'm sure some clinicians do it. However, you do want to rule out that emerging sepsis is the cause of low urine output. And if at any point you uncover another acute problem, such as hypotension, switch to that framework instead because that will likely be a more urgent problem. Another common mistake during this evaluation is relying too heavily on vital signs. Vitals are typically unhelpful for diagnosis when evaluating low urine output. Why is that? Because excluding obstruction, every other common etiology, such as hypovolemia, heart failure, or sepsis, they all commonly cause tachycardia and low blood pressure. 
Regarding empiric treatment of low urine output, it depends on the suspected mechanism. If hypovolemia is suspected, bolus IV fluids, in almost all cases, a balanced fluid such as lactate at ringers or plasma light will be superior to normal saline. If worsening heart failure is suspected, give IV diuretics and or inotropes depending on the patient's volume status and likely cardiac output. If even considering inotropes in a patient with low urine output, that's probably a patient who the inpatient cardiology consult team should know about. If urinary retention is confirmed, place a Foley catheter provided that there are no contraindications, such as recent lower GU surgery, in which case you should be calling urology anyway. Consider discontinuing any potentially causative medications. In older men, consider the initiation of an alpha blocker if they're not already on one. The primary argument against doing this routinely is that the urinary retention may be a transient problem related to acute illness, but a patient discharged on a new alpha blocker will probably never have the necessity of that medication re-examined as an outpatient. While I have seen alpha blockers prescribed in women in this general situation, it's relatively uncommon and I am personally unconvinced it's a good idea. Regarding how long to keep the catheter in place before seeing if the patient can spontaneously void, there seems to be no shortage of opinions on this, but little data or published guidance. What I've seen done in real life is anything from performing a spontaneous voiding trial after three days of bladder decompression, or within 24 hours prior to the planned discharge, or discharging the patient with a catheter in place and referring them to urology clinic in anywhere from one to four weeks to perform the voiding trial there at that time. The most appropriate option will depend on the situation and also depend on local practice. Lastly, there are several common pitfalls in responding to a patient with low urine output. Failing to distinguish low urine output from acute kidney injury. Assuming the presence of tachycardia means a patient is hypovolemic and must necessarily need IV fluids. Reflexively giving IV fluids before checking for urinary retention. Failing to consider emerging sepsis as a potential explanation. And ordering a bladder scan on a patient with large ascites.